You know, there's an interesting misconception that people have about originality because we definitely love to exalt originality. And I, for one, am not going to change that. But I will tell you this, that most genius has taken someone else's idea and developed it. And in preaching, and I say this to young preachers a lot, they're constantly wishing that they could sound uh, original and have no reference to anything else uh, that someone else has done before. And that is a huge mistake. Now, today, I'm going to look at you and talk about a phrase, what are you waiting for? Uh, Act like you didn't hear that before. That's a very unoriginal but perhaps provocative title. But the fact of it is, I'm going to refer to some Bible stories that are not new to you, and the ideas are not new. And it's important sometimes that we don't lose sight of the power of a truth simply because a lot of people have talked about it. The power of this truth is, what are you waiting for? Uh, If someone asked me, what is the most common spiritual warfare problem that I see? People that are living on hold, that have postponed a vision, that are waiting on certain things to come or do or change before they really take action with what they believe they're about and what they were born to do. Now, this is the first thing that I want to drive home to you. It's not original, but it's about you. Whenever disaster strikes and whenever there's a time of darkness in the land, like now, whenever there's a power vacuum in leadership, people begin to believe that someone else could do the job. Someone else should do the job. And we start saying things like, why doesn't somebody... And when that somebody could very well be you. An old saying is, never tell a young person that something is impossible. Because God may have been waiting a hundred years for that very young person to arrive on the scene. That's you. And that's what I want to talk about. In 1 Samuel 14, there is an unfair circumstance that has happened to two young men. One is Jonathan, the son of the king. The other is his armor bearer. Now listen to this, because this is really key. They had made a foreign policy mistake that had brought the Philistines to them, over a million soldiers. Israel didn't even have a weapon. I talked about this to you recently, but I'm bringing it up again for a very important reason. In 1 Samuel 14, the Bible tells us in verse 6, Then Jonathan said to his armor bearer, let us go over to the garrison of these Philistines. Perhaps the Lord will work for us, for there is nothing restraining God, whether to save by few or to save by many. Now, the realization that you are the one that has to act is the beginning of this answering the question, what are you waiting for? Now, let's say you've been chosen to do something. Let's say that you've told yourself a thousand times, I'm not educated, I'm not qualified, I'm not connected, I don't have the resources. There's no way that I could possibly be that person. Imagine the problem of arguing with God, of debating God's choice, of seeming to think you're smarter than God who looks at all of those things that you've just mentioned. It can't be me. I'm not smart enough. I'm not talented enough. I'm not connected enough. I'm, and even you might even say, I'm not holy enough. I'm not disciplined enough. We need to turn it around and not say to God, okay, these are all the reasons I couldn't possibly be the person. You're admitting by your protest. You're fighting something off. What are you admitting by your protest? that you are inwardly convicted that you might in fact be that person. So instead of saying, why can't I be that person? Reverse it entirely. Why does God think I'm that person? And then you'll begin to understand. Nobody in the Bible who was a true spiritual hero ever went to the battle willingly or zealously. It was always reluctantly. It was always with a mountain of self-doubt and hesitation. But the fact is, 
The first issue is you are that person, and it begins with that. If I'm that person, God can discipline me. If I'm that person, God will make the connections. If I'm that person, God will send the teacher when I'm ready to be the student. And that is an essential part of this. Now, let me talk about this in one other phrase. You are the one to do this. This is important. You are the one to do this. There was a train accident one time in England where the transcripts to a grammar school uh, got all mixed up. The upshot of it was that a group of students that were remedial, they were falling behind, and they were essentially what we would call special ed, were mixed up with students who were exceptional. And so the teachers at the beginning of the school year began to teach students that were remedial as if they were exceptional. And they began to teach students that were exceptional as if they were remedial. And the students did something amazing. They began to live up or live down to their teacher's expectation. Students that were considered remedial suddenly, because of the teacher's belief that they were exceptional, their performance improved. Now, that's what's going to happen when you surrender to God. When you surrender to God and realize, I'm the one that God has chosen to do something amazing, then you're going to discover that God's confidence will overrule your self-doubt. God's ability to believe in you will be more powerful than your own ability to talk yourself out of being that person. Now, let's talk about the next one. In the story of 1 Kings 18, Elijah is about to go on Mount Carmel. There's been no waterfall from the sky in seven years. Now, this sets up an amazing moment. God says to Elijah, go show yourself to King Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. Now, in the midst of a drought, the king, like everyone else, has livestock that is dying for lack of food. So he says to Obadiah, his assistant, go down into the springs in the valley and see if you can find grass. And he says to his assistant, so that we can save the horses. This is in uh, 1 Kings 18, verse 5. And I'll read it. And Ahab said to Obadiah, go into the land, to all the springs of water, to all the brooks, Perhaps we may find grass to keep the horses alive. Meanwhile, Elijah is going up on top of a mountain to pray for rain. One group is looking for grass. The other is praying for rain. Don't you find it odd when Christians get on a jet plane to go to a meeting across the country where they heard revival was breaking out? I believe that's called looking for grass because they could have prayed for rain right in their own city. So instead of believing God that he could pour out his spirit on their church, their city, they're going to chase all these patches of grass. They'll read in a magazine, God's moving over here. And to a lesser degree, there's another one. A young person will say, I could be awesome if I could get away from my parents or if I was a pastor of a different group of people. Or if I lived in another city. In other words, you're looking for grass. You're thinking that the drought in your current location is best relieved by packing up all your belongings and getting out. Now, mind you, since I just moved, I better explain something. You see, the the exception to this rule of grass and rain is the leading of God who led Abraham. But most often... When you relocate, you usually don't want to. The individual that is led by God to go somewhere else usually doesn't want to go there. They love it right where they are. And that shows the sincerity often of the guidance of God that they're receiving. Now, let's look at this. Do you want to look for grass or pray for rain? Do you believe that that if I were to relocate? First, we've dealt with the first question. Am I the person? What are you waiting for? You're the guy. You're the one. Secondly, this is the place. 
not somewhere else, not relocating, not hoping that if I could get away from all these individuals that I would suddenly be a wonderful person because you are going to go with you wherever you go. I feel like Brooke Shields all of a sudden. All right, looking for grass is in essence saying, I am not able to receive a miracle directly from God, so I must relocate and take matters into my own hands. Now, I'm going to talk to you about something else. We talk about skills. We talk about abilities. I want to tell you something that I find incredibly hilarious. A church will become famous because a revival broke out in their church. I've seen it again and again and again. A church, the spirit will fall, crowds will come. No sooner are these crowds coming and the church explodes than they feel the overwhelming urge to have a convention to explain how we did it. And nine times out of ten, what they tell you with their syllabus, their binder, their teaching has nothing to do with how God blessed them. It happened entirely different than what they're teaching. Why? Because there is this temptation, this gravitational force, this need to sound exotic and original and powerful and creative. It wasn't the smoke, the fog machine, the strobe lights, or any of that stuff. What it was is a simple cry to God. God, move in our church. And I, I tell you that that is a factor that's very important because what we tend to teach others is simply this. Success is the result of something that you do not already have. Now, follow me. Even though you've heard this before, see it in a new light. The widow whose husband had just died and is now in abject poverty who lived for God and served God and had a husband who was truly godly, runs to the prophet and says to him, I want to remind you that my husband was a great man of God. And now we have no money and they're coming to take my sons into slavery to settle a debt. So Elijah, Elisha looks at her and says the strangest thing she ever expected. Because in all of her thinking, whatever is going to solve my son's going into slavery problem is going to come from outside of my circumstances. I need the Calvary to come in. The Air Force needs to arrive. Something outside of me. So she's shocked when the prophet says these words. And Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Question number two, what do you have in your house. So now here it is. Not only are you the person and where you are is the place, you already have the components, the tools, the implement, and the seed for accomplishing your mission. It's with you. So you see what's happening in this, in this lesson? Excuses are dying. Taking your life off of hold, out of this spin of of circling over the airstrip without landing, of waiting for something. Now, there is a psalm that's very special. It's Psalm 39. You know what it's about? It's about the fear of wasting your life. Think about that. If you read Psalm 39, you'll see a man whose very heart is gripped by the possibility that life could pass him by. So he goes through all of these statements in prayer. He says, God, show me if there's sin in my life. Teach me to number my days and remind me how futile and fleeting life can be. He's overcome by the fear that literally he'll wake up one day and had no life. He never lived. He never was alive. He wasted his life. That's a tremendous burden. And then it gripped him that there is something insane about regretting the possibility that you could waste your life if you know God. 
And he said, I know God. And he said the, in Psalm 39, verse 7, And now, O Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. And that's exactly what I want to conclude with. What are you waiting for? We now know that you're chosen. We now know that you don't need to relocate. We now know that there is nothing missing in your house for the power to be used of God in an extraordinary manner. And we finally know that you don't have to be afraid to start because you know God and your hope is in God. And because your hope is in God, you're going to get started. As soon as this video is over, in fact, you're going to get started because God is with you. God bless you. Until next time, this is Mario Murillo.